Back in my glory days in high school in Utah, I was a basketball player, was being the key word in that sentence, by the way. And one of our players on our team was not a Latter-day Saint. And sometimes we and some of his friends tried to teach him about the church and our teenage wisdom, usually to no avail. But when my older brother left on his mission, my non-Latter-day Saint friend attended his mission farewell. I still remember that my brother gave a parable in his mission farewell talk that he called the gospel according to basketball. When the meeting was all over, my friend turned to me and he said, that was the first time in my entire life I've ever understood anything about Jesus. Because they're so effective, it's not uncommon to use parables to help people understand gospel teachings. There's something in us that seeks to take abstract heavenly concepts and relate them to concrete earthly experiences. Think of so many classic parables in the church, like Stephen Robinson's famous parable of the bicycle, or Brad Wilcox's famous parable of the piano to help us understand grace, Boyd K. Packer's parable of the mediator to help us understand the atonement, or David A. Bednar's parable of the pickle to understand conversion. And one of my personal favorites, Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf's parable about the cheap man on the Mediterranean pleasure cruise. And of course, Jesus, as the master teacher of all, often employed teaching through parables. In fact, the book of Mark says that, quote, without a parable spake he not unto them, end of quote. One thing that is different from a good moral of the story and an effective parable, however, is that good parables are multi-layered, and the teacher often leaves them uninterpreted as people reflect on them again and again, drawing different meaning. The Christian preacher named Fred Craddock calls this overhearing the gospel, a great phrase, explaining that there are direct but also indirect methods to teach. Without dismissing the benefit of direct teaching, as it has its uses at times, the indirect method of a good story or parable, Craddock concludes, is often preferable because it elicits and draws out what is already known in the individual. Indirect stories and parables, he argues, is a lot like a midwife acting as an intermediary to draw out meaning that's already within. Hank Smith from BYU's Religion Department, a great storyteller himself, by the way, has recently published a great book about the effectiveness of the parables of Jesus. It was a couple of years ago, we started this, come follow me, and we're going to teach in the Savior's way. And I, and I read through the manuals going, that's not how Jesus taught, <laughs> right? Like, geez, if, if we want to teach in the Savior's way, we walk in the room, we tell a random story, and then we leave. Uh, and we never explain what we meant by that. Stories have a way of connecting with people and right. staying with them. On today's episode, get ready to hear some great direct and indirect teachings from the Savior's parables why he used them to teach, and why we should seek to do the same today. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Casey Griffiths sat down with his colleague, Professor Hank Smith, to discuss his publication called Living the Parables. In part one, Professor Smith will explain a little bit about two confusing words, exegesis and eisegesis, trying to help us understand the difference. He'll also discuss why parables are so effective, and he'll move into some of the many parables of Jesus, specifically the parable of the sower and the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. In part two, he'll move a little bit more into application, like usual, discussing how we can think about incorporating this type of teaching in our modern discourse. And in part three, he will conclude with a little bit of his own story that brought him to BYU to be a religious educator. Here then is Casey Griffiths interviewing Hank Smith. 
We are so pleased today to be here with Hank Smith. Hank is the author of Living the Parables, Applying Christ's Teachings to Our Lives, along with Catherine Jenkins, yep. uh, who assisted you in writing this book. Um, Hank, we've known each other for I don't know how long, going back. Uh, I think it's back to the 1900s, maybe. I, I it's think it close. might be yeah. back when the earth was young and still yes. cooling. <laughs> Um, but I'm delighted to see uh, some of your work in print and uh, to see how much of your personality, how much of your joy uh, kind of comes through uh, in the writing. So tell us a little bit about this book. Why, why did you want to write this and, and how do you think it'll help people? So the book, I was, I was really excited about this. So when I, I first came to BYU about 10 years ago, I was assigned to teach uh, the four Gospels and uh, really excited. I, I don't think I knew a lot about the four Gospels. You know, as a seminary teacher, I taught the the New Testament every four years. Mm-hmm. And it seems like every time I would, I would come around to teach it again, I had forgotten everything uh, that I once knew. So being able to teach it here, I was able to teach, you know, three times a year, go through the Gospels three times a year. Um, and I developed a love for uh for the parables. Um, I, I think I started seeing things that I'd never seen before, um, being able to look at it over and over and over again. Uh, and then uh, Education Week came at BYU, and I decided to do a big you know, lecture series on the parables. Uh, and that turned, in, that turned into the book. The exciting thing for me, I think, is that these stories are so old. Um, they are 2,000 years old, and here they can affect my life. They can, they can make a supreme difference in my marriage, in my relationship with my children. Uh, if I'm going through some you know, difficult problem, when people are going through uh, suffering with depression or anxiety or going through some tragedy, the parables of Jesus um, are relevant today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think uh, that gets me excited, the idea that um, hey, let me show you this because I really think it'll make a profound difference in you know what you're facing. One of the things that I really liked about the book is that in your introduction, you kind of introduce a lot of complex biblical concepts, uh, scholarly concepts like the overlap between the synoptic gospels right. uh, and how unique the gospel of John is. And you introduce two terms here <laughs> okay. that some of our readers are going to be familiar with and a lot right. of them won't, but I want you to just kind of explain and outline. So the first is exegesis. Yep. And the second is eisegesis. Um, I had a friend who was a seminary teacher who tried to teach these to his class, and one of the kids said, exegesis and eisegesis, you need to find a Jesus. Uh, <laughs> he, he didn't get what we were talking about. But um, knowing that this, this book on its cover is about application, can you kind of explain the difference in approach between exegesis and eisegesis? Absolutely. I remember— For, for layman. Right. I remember coming to, uh, coming to BYU as, as a seminary teacher, felt like I understood things, and someone said the word exegesis. And I thought, I'm not ex-Jesus. I'm, I'm pro-Jesus. I'm for Jesus. Uh, and then um, later I, I started to look into it and figured out that these are two uh, two ways of looking at scripture, looking at ancient ancient text. Exegesis is this idea of, I'm going to, to let the text speak for itself. I am going to go in. I'm not going to have any sort of framework or lens. I'm just going to say, what does the text itself say? And I want to look at it as an ancient document. I want to look at it at, in its original context, who it was written by and who it was written for. You know, we get the idea sometimes that all scripture was written specifically for us. Mm-hmm. And it, it not necessarily, it, it, it could be written for somebody else. And so I need to understand who that audience was and how they would have seen it in their day. So then um, eisegesis, can, I think, can come off of exegesis. Uh, a lot of us try to do eisegesis, which is the idea of, I'm going to find things in the scriptures for me. I have specific problems. I have, I have, um, I have circumstances that I'm in, and I want to see if, if the scriptures can speak to those circumstances. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that's wonderful, but uh, you, I think if you don't first understand it in its original context, you're going to, you, you're going to be you could be off off in no man's land when it comes to scripture. You might even take things out of context and, and get it wrong. Mm-hmm. So uh, what I tried to do with the book is saying, okay, let's first understand the parables in their original context, the way Jesus probably meant them. Let's look at, uh, let's look at traditions. Let's look at uh, how people live their lives, how his audience would have received them. And then let's look at application. Uh, so to me, it's not more – I don't want to say it's more advanced to do an exegetical reading. 
But to me, it's a little more careful uh, and uh, a little more um, responsible, I guess, Mm -hmm. in scripture study to go in and say, okay, I just want to look at it in the way it was written, um, who it was written for, what circumstances they were given. You do this, I'm sure, with with the Doctrine and Covenants, right? Because there's a lot of things in the Doctrine and Covenants I could take out of context if I don't understand who the Lord's talking to sure, and what yeah. circumstances they were in. Uh, but then once I get that, I think eisegesis becomes really fun, uh, becomes a way of saying, okay, now that I understand it and I can be responsible with it, what can I learn uh, for for my own life? Uh, it becomes very fun, responsible, and uh, and you don't take things out of context anymore, which I think is uh, something I used to do as a teacher. I'd take things out of context and apply them to my students. And maybe I, I was out of bounds uh, with some of that because I didn't understand its original form. Now, just to translate for Latter-day Saint audience, eisegesis is likening the scriptures right. to ourselves, yeah. right? You take you take the principles and say, how does this work in my life? And exegesis is understanding things in context. Yeah, I love the way in each one of these chapters how you kind of blend those two disciplines uh, together. And and overlap them a little bit. Is there is there one that you think is more important for a person to master than the other, or is it a false comparison to say exegesis is more important than eisegesis? Yeah, I guess it depends on who you ask. Uh, when I listen to uh, biblical scholars, uh, especially those outside of uh, our faith, uh, they just say, "Oh, eisegesis is hokey Sunday school." You know, Sunday school lessons, that's not what we're here for. We're here for the real good stuff, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, But to me, I think if you don't ever bridge that gap, if you don't ever jump over to my life, when when are the scriptures ever going to take on power then? When are they ever going to take on meaning something I can, I can, I can feel out in my own life? I mean, the, the Savior himself, I think, used eisegesis in, in, in the scriptures. Nephi takes Isaiah and applies it to himself, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Where Isaiah wasn't talking to Nephi. He wasn't talking, you know, specifically about this, but but Nephi is thinking, I can use this. I can apply this in my own life. Uh, there's, there's times where I kind of smile because I think, Nephi, you're taking Isaiah a little out of context there, <laughs> right? That's not what he meant, but you're using it for you. Uh, and I've, I've, I felt like, hey, no, that's that's meaningful and useful. But I do think that those of us who love Isagesus cannot discount exegesis. It, it's kind of like saying, well, I really don't, I don't want to do the hard work of understanding, so I'm just going to go in and look for me. Um, I remember doing that as a, as a you know, brand new seminary student. I was in ninth grade, and they said I had to read my scriptures every night, and so I just went through and highlighted phrases I liked. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> be of good cheer. Ooh, I like that. Right? <laughs> be strong and of good courage. Mm-hmm. I like that. Well, who's he talking to? I don't know. Um, <laughs> who's what's the what's happening in his in that person's life? I don't know. I just like that phrase. So um, I think. Uh, the one that's most important is probably the one you're not doing. Uh, and you need to say, I've got to learn how to do that so I can have both. Now, tell us, um, we, we've kind of set the table for your process now. Is okay. it okay if we walk through a couple parables? Yeah, this will be fun. Uh, because I was amazed at how comprehensive, I think every parable Jesus utters, even if it's only you know a verse long. I really tried to get most of them. You know, depending on who you ask, there's about 55. And I tried to cover as many as I could before the the, the publisher said, it's too long. It's okay. too much, right? <laughs> so let's do let's do some of the greatest hits, and then okay, we'll go yeah. into a few obscure ones. Uh, so, parable of the sower. Um, walk us through exegesis and eisegesis uh, with the parable of the sower. Absolutely, this is probably one of the Savior's most popular parables, right? Um, usually, if you ask uh, the average Latter Day Saint, "Give me, give me uh, the what parables of Jesus you know," the sower comes up, prodigal son, mm-hmm. good Samaritan, mm-hmm. and then they start reaching. Uh, so these are this is one of the the big three I would call it. So the parable of the sower uh, is found in three of the four gospels. All the synoptic gospels bring it up, and this is only one of two that the Savior actually explains. So when it comes to parables, uh, most of them, over ninety percent of them, Jesus never tells us what he meant. Uh, that that's that's exciting <laughs> stuff, right? Like, yeah. He just kind of left it open for us and said, "I'm just gonna, you know, leave this here for you, and you can analyze it for the next couple millennia." Uh, and that's that's exciting. Um, but this one, he actually explains what he means. So if we look at it, you you have to understand uh, the way someone in Jesus's time would have sowed seeds or planted a garden. Um, it's definitely not like us in Utah, where we make our rows and we plant the seeds one by one. Uh, a, a, 
a planter or a gardener in Jesus's time is going to go out and he's just going to toss seeds everywhere. He's going to toss them into the air and they just let the wind take them. Um, it's such fertile soil uh, in the Holy Land. You've been there, uh, especially up in Galilee where it's very green and moist, right? The ground is going to be beautiful. And he's just going to toss seeds everywhere, let the wind take them. And then he's going to see what, what comes up, right? Uh, well, some of those seeds are going to fall on basically the sidewalk, and uh, where, you know, where his grandfather walked and his grandfather walked and his grandfather walked mm. and that ground uh, is going to be really hard. And I think what Jesus is saying, some seeds are going to fall there uh, and they're not going to grow. Um, and it's not up to the farmer to go plow the sidewalk, right? I, if you couldn't grow squash on your driveway, I wouldn't be like, well, you're, you're a terrible gardener, right? It's just not going to happen. And I think maybe the Savior is saying, hey, um, some people are going to hear the gospel and they're not going, it's just not going to work. It's not going to happen. And you have to be okay with that. Uh, other ground that those seeds are going to be taken by the wind and they're going to find place, places where there's so many rocks in the ground. It hasn't been, uh, the ground hasn't been worked at all. And the, the seeds may grow a little bit, uh, but eventually those, the roots are going to hit the rocks and uh, it's just going to die. It's going to be scorched by the sun. Mm -hmm. um, the people in his day would have totally understood this. They'd been like, oh yeah, that does happen. I don't even worry about those plants because I know they're going to they're gonna be scorched, right? And then he said, others are going to grow in ground where you're not going to, you haven't weeded, right? So it's going to grow up with weeds and eventually the weeds are going to, are going to kill the plant because it just can't compete for resources. Uh, and then he said, it's, some are going to fall onto the ground you've prepared, this good ground, and it's going to grow up and give you all sorts of all sorts of fruit. Now, my favorite after that is when uh, the he kind of walks away at that moment. <laughs> he just kind of mic, drops the mic and walks away, and his apostles are going, hey, what, does this mean? Yeah, yeah. Why, what are you talking why are, about? Why are you teaching in parables? You know, because if you're an apostle, you've sat and listened to the Sermon on the Mount. Right, which has this incredible plain doctrine. You're the light of the world, the city that is set on a hill. And you've brought maybe people who are interested in hearing Jesus. And he just told a story about a, you know, a guy planting seeds. And uh, the apostles say, Why, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And he said, well, um, in essence, the Savior said, some are going to hear this and they're not going to they're not going to go go any further. They're not going to want to hear. But some are going to really want this. And, I, and I'm in essence, the Savior is saying, "I'm going to see if how far they'll how far how far they'll go to think this through," mm -hmm. and then He says, "Well, okay, let me tell you, let me tell you what I meant by this." And to me, this is where the application comes in. Um, he said, "There's some people who have such hard hearts that they will never hear the word. It's just not going to happen." You and I have had students like this um, uh, in my life. I've met people like this. So when I was a missionary. I met people like this who were so intent on misunderstanding me that it was just not going to happen. And that doesn't mean I'm a bad teacher. It just means that's that's part of life. Uh, there's some where the ground is just not ready. Um, there's things that in my life, are there things in my life that stop my gospel roots from growing deep? Are there addictions in my life? Are there, and you can kind of label those big rocks that really just my testimony just can't grow. Um, the one that scares me the most probably for me personally is, is when the plant grows in the weeds, the sound, the ground is good, but there's just so many, uh, there's so many other things that are growing in my life that I don't have time for the gospel that, oh, that one scares me. I've got to weed my life, Casey. I don't know about you, but, <laughs> but when, if I don't have time to read my scriptures and pray and attend the temple back when the temples were open, um, I'm too, I'm too busy. I have, I, I've got to weed my life of some things. Mm -hmm. um, I remember talking about this with uh, uh, one of my friends and he said, he said, mountain, bi mountain biking has taken over my, taken over my life. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, he said, I love it so much. I planted it. And now it's just kind of, it's, it's taking all my time and energy. And uh, that's like the nutrients of the soil are these weeds that don't really give us a lot in return are taking all the, the sunlight. They're taking all the nutrients out of the soil and my testimony just can't grow. So if anybody listening 
thinks, yeah, that's that's me because I know that I I have a tendency to go that direction. I would, I I think I say in the book, weed your life, right? Delete the apps that take so much of your time that don't that don't really do anything for you. Right. Um, and then the last one, the Savior says, there's good ground. And each plant grows a little bit differently. Some bring forth 30 fold, some 60, some 100. And he doesn't seem upset about that. I, I wish I could hear the tone of his voice if he's saying some 30, some 60, some 100, right? Like, but it seems that if he's, he's just saying the three of them together, that I, I don't have the same expectations of everyone. Um, I, you know, I, where much is given. Much is required, but for some, I'm okay with just a little bit of a return. So there's um, there's an essence for me of application there that I don't have to compare myself to someone like Casey Griffiths, who I think is brilliant and uh, can can write and teach like uh, like it, like it just like it's going out of style, right? Like <laughs> wow, that guy uh, that guy really has it, and I don't have to say, oh, I'll never I'll never make it, I'll never make it because I can't teach like that. Where the Savior's like, hey, I'm okay with your effort, right? So um, if you don't, if you think, do you see that if you didn't understand just the small little way that that Jewish gardeners are out there planting, <laughs> that you're kind of lost. You're going, why would anybody plant seeds on the sidewalk? Like, is yeah. he crazy? Uh, but that's, but if you could just understand it, if you can see him out there scattering seeds, you're going, oh yeah, I totally get it. And the audience would have understood it too. Well, and one of the things that's so useful about the parable of the sower is Jesus, like you said, one of two times explains his methodology. Right. The disciples come to him and say, why do you teach like this? Hank, why do you think that the Savior chose to teach in parables? And, and what's the power uh, to be found in this kind of oh, teaching? Oh, I love it. I I don't think it's – there's a teaching tool called apperception. Um, which is a useful tool where you take something that somebody understands to teach them about a principle they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Much like um, uh, when I was a kid, there was a talk by Troy Dunn called Life is Like a Football Game. Right. And I understood football, but I didn't understand life. And he <laughs> took football and said, you know, uh, that Jesus is your coach. Satan's on the opposing team. He's coaching the opposing team. They want, you know, and I thought, oh, okay. And he's like, timeouts, that's, that's EFY. That's, you know, seminary. And mm -hmm. I was like, got it. Okay. Um, I don't think that's what Jesus is doing here. One, because he he rarely explains it. Mm. Um, apperception as a tool is the teacher explaining how one thing is like another, and Jesus doesn't do that. I think part of what the Savior is doing here is telling these incredible but simple stories. And then uh, I think it was Talmadge who said, um, People had used parables before, but he, but the Savior, you know how Talmadge writes, right? He's the Savior might as well be the creator of the parable because he's done it better than anybody else right, ever. Right. Um, I think what the Savior was doing was almost veiling the meaning a little bit, just kind of covering it up. So those of us who, who aren't ready to hear, uh, we hear a story. Right? I think in the Bible dictionary, it says, to the dull and uninspired, a parable is a mere story. <laughs> it uses right? those words, dull, dull and, and uninspired, right? They, uh, it's a mere story. You, they hear it and go, That's, that wouldn't make a very good movie, right? A guy out planting seeds. That, that's not <laughs> – I, I wouldn't watch that movie. And they kind of walk away. And maybe that's a merciful thing almost mm -hmm. because if I'm not ready to hear that, I'm not going to be held accountable for it. To me, it was a mere story. But – um, to, he said, uh, but those who really want to see, it reveals the mysteries of heaven. And so you start to dig a little bit, parable of the sower. Um, you start to kind of sift through it. And then all of a sudden, the message starts to come out at you. And the thing I love about the parables, specifically for me, and uh, hopefully this isn't trite because we say this about the Book of Mormon all the time, but I'm still getting new things things I've never seen before. And it's not because the parable's changing, but I'm changing. Mm -hmm. And so the parable changes for me as my circumstances change. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of power in that. There's a, there's a lot of beauty there that I can now go back to something I've already read dozens of times and find new things because, you know, I'm in new circumstances. There's a timelessness there right. that makes it so that 2,000 years removed, you can still relate to planting seeds in a garden. Or family problems like the par the prodigal son. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, or There's a universality. Helping someone on the side of the road right. in the parable of Good Samaritan. There is. He chose things that were going to be around forever. Is there, a, is there a parable 
that you went through in this book that really resonates with oh, you? Oh, man. Is there, there one? Oh, there that, is that one. And it's it's the best parable Jesus told, and uh, <laughs> that is the truth. Uh, <laughs> no. There is a parable that not very many people know about in the Gospel of Luke called uh, Lazarus and the Rich Man. Mm. And I'll ask my students about this one, and they have no idea what it's about. I'm remembering dogs licking sores. Yes. Oh, this parable <laughs> yeah. is so good. I get so excited every time every time um, it comes up when I teach because uh, one, it's new to most people. They're mm-hmm. going, oh, I, I don't remember this one. It's, it's not talked about in general conference all that much. Um, not that I know of anyway, but this parable is just fantastic. So what you've got is you've got the Savior starting with extremes. On one end, there's a very rich man who's clothed in purple. And if you understand a little context, purple is made from crushing snails. And you have to have a lot of snails to get purple clothes. Mm -hmm. So he is rich. He says he fares sumptuously every day, meaning he's got clothes, he's got food, he's got shelter. He is he is living the good life. On the other extreme is this man who is the only named person in any of Jesus's parables. His name is Lazarus, uh, which is interesting because the Savior had a friend right. named Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, the man who he raises from the dead in John 11. Well, uh, he uh, is on the other side of this extreme. He is his His body is covered in sores. Instead of being clothed in purple, his body is covered in sores. Um, and he, uh, he is, he, uh, he is on the side of the, the road right in front of this rich man's house. And it says the dogs come and lick his sores. And people right. have said, why is Ugh. that in there? What's going That's on? That's such a visceral image. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think there are a couple of reasons. One, it might be telling us that, that Lazarus can't even get the dogs away. That's, he's in such a, a poor state that when a dog comes up to lick his sores, he does not have the energy or the strength or the the mobility to move a dog away. Or the savior might be saying, this is how people see him, right? He is a, he is like one of the animals that's, that just kind of roams the streets, right? right? So you've got these two extremes. And what happens is it's so wonderful to talk about is their situations are completely flopped. Um, Lazarus dies and the savior goes into a long, um, a long kind of um, explanation of that the angels took him all the way to the to, to to sit with Abraham in Abraham's bosom. You're right, Abraham's bosom. And if you understand Abraham to uh, a Jewish person, he's the father of our religion, right? So it'd be like me saying, uh, "This person died and went and is now having dinner with Joseph and Emma Smith, right, in heaven." And you're going, "Oh, right, that, that's that's wonderful, right?" His his situation has become wonderful. Oh, and while they were on Earth. The rich man was eating uh, lavish, wonderful meals, and all Lazarus wanted was just the crumbs that fell from the table. He doesn't want to take everything from, right, off the table. He doesn't feel like he deserves that. He's just like, can I have the crumbs? Which is fascinating because when their situations are flopped and Lazarus is eating with Abraham, the rich man has found himself in hell. Um, It just says the rich man died and was buried. By the way, isn't it interesting that for those of us – uh, those of us who who know about celebrities and things, uh, we would know the name of the rich man. We would know his name, right? I can name ri- a bunch of rich people that I know of who I've never met. They don't know me, but I can name them. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if I can name the homeless guy on the street. Right. But the Savior says, oh, that homeless man, that's Lazarus. Well, who's that rich guy? Eh, some yeah, rich guy. Doesn't matter. Right, yeah, it doesn't matter. So now their situations are flopped. And um, the rich man finds himself in hell and he is so thirsty that he talks to Abraham and he says, Father Abraham, he can see them, right? Just like on earth when Lazarus could see the rich man eating, now the the rich man can see Lazarus eating. And uh, he says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and come and and send Lazarus, which is interesting because that tells us he knows his name. Mm. He knew who he was and he still sees him as a servant. <laughs> He's <laughs> even in hell and Lazarus is in, in heaven. And he said, um, can you send Lazarus over here with, a, with water and he can touch my tongue with the water, which I've never, I've never been so thirsty that I've asked someone, hey, could you just touch the water and touch my tongue? (laughs) Uh, What's interesting is the irony there because all Lazarus wanted was crumbs. And all this guy wants is drops of water. That's all he wants is drops of water. So the Savior has has switched their position, right? And Abraham in the story, Jesus is telling the story. So um, Abraham, as in the story, says, isn't that interesting? 
he basically says to the rich man, isn't that interesting how your life was so good and his life was so bad, and now your life is so bad and his life is so good? Isn't that interesting? And I think the rich man would think, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then Abraham says, I can't come to you. There's a gap between between us, which of course, as Latter-day Saints, we love, uh, I love that idea that that the gap between spirit prison and spirit paradise wasn't, wasn't um, bridged until... Uh, the Savior died, which when this story was told, hadn't happened yet. Well, um, then uh, then the rich man says, well, at least send Lazarus, again, servant, send him back to my, to my brothers so they don't come to this place of torment. And then Abraham makes just a wonderful statement. He said, they have the scriptures. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the scriptures. If they wouldn't believe them, they wouldn't even believe if, and I love to say this to my student, they wouldn't even believe if Lazarus came back from the dead, right? Uh, which is going to happen mm -hmm. later on. A man named Lazarus is going to come back from the dead, or he might even be talking about the Savior himself, mm -hmm. right? That they wouldn't even believe. They have the scriptures, but if they don't believe the scriptures, then they wouldn't believe uh, if if this uh, if someone came back from the dead. Now, to me, the, the probably the application part of this parable, which is so scary, is. What if the only things I get in heaven are the things I gave away? Mm. And I ask my students that. What would you have in heaven today if the, the only things you had there were the things you gave away? And they're going gum, uh, <laughs> pencils, uh, old clothes, <laughs> cookies, right? Uh, I said, would you live differently? Would you live differently if you knew the only things you would have in heaven are the things you gave away here on earth? And it, yes, absolutely, I would live differently. I'd be giving away the nicest stuff so I could have it later. And I think that's the parables of Jesus. If they don't make you uncomfortable, you don't understand them uh, because there's some points in those parables where you're going, that makes me really uncomfortable, right? That, I, that means I got to change. And that's, I think that's where the beauty is. Each year, BYU Religious Education and the Religious Studies Center sponsor the annual BYU Easter Conference. There's always a great keynote address from a prominent church leader or teacher, accompanied by other speakers, educators, scholars, historians, and experts around the life of Christ. All speakers talk about the Savior, His life, His mission, His atonement, and His influence in our daily lives. Last year in 2020, the conference was unfortunately canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The great news is that this year it's going forward, however, this time available for everybody because it's being broadcast digitally on the RSC's YouTube channel. The keynote speaker is Sister Marie Hafen, along with talks by Tyler Griffin and Jennifer Reeder. Just Google BYU Easter Conference 2021 and you can watch their presentations on the RSC's YouTube channel as you celebrate and learn more about Christ this Easter season. Again, that's BYU Easter Conference 2021. We've been listening to Casey Griffiths interview his colleague Hank Smith about his publication on Christ's parables. In part two of Why Religion, we like to get a little bit more into specific applications related to this publication for the everyday saint. Although Professor Smith has already drawn some excellent and relatable lessons for us from a few of Christ's parables, in part two, he discusses a little bit more about how we can incorporate this type of teaching into our modern discourse, even how social media like Twitter and Instagram can be a good place for parable and story in a way to condense truth and communicate quickly and clearly as parables do. So here's Hank Smith and Casey Griffiths. And I wonder sometimes, uh, like the first time I went to the temple, I remember uh, going through the ceremony and then waiting for somebody to come out and explain what all this meant. And it never happened. <laughs> uh, we, we're so used to church where a person gets up and literally starts their talk by saying, my talk is on repentance. The dictionary defines right, repentance. Exactly. As, uh, is, there, is there an advantage in using this type of teaching? And, and is there in your mind, maybe a way that we could incorporate this kind of teaching a little bit more into our discourse within the church. No, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. The 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 temple language, the temple uh, ceremony uh, is, is very, it's much like 
a parable, mm -hmm. right? Where you have to, you get to look specifically at little pieces of it um, and say, okay, what does that mean? What could that mean? What could that mean to me? Uh, those of us who don't want to put in the work or the effort, I remember being 19 years old and going through the temple and just went, hmm, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what that meant, but I'm, I'm happy I went through the temple. I, I, I like the way I felt. Um, and you could never go back and you could never, you would never know. Right, you would never know, and maybe that's a merciful thing, just mm -hmm. like the parables. I, it's it's a mere story, right? Uh, but uh, I think in the church, um, you know, it's it's. I always joke around with my students that we 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 call we say uh, we're gonna. It was a couple of years ago we started this. Come follow me, and we're gonna teach in the Savior's way. And I and I read through the manuals, going, that's not how Jesus taught, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> geez, if if we want to teach in the Savior's way, we walk in the room, we tell a random story, <laughs> and then we leave, uh, and we never explain what we meant by that. Uh, but I think we could do. I think we could do a better job of saying, okay, um, stories have a way of connecting with people right. and staying with them. President Monson knew this. That if I could, I could give a lecture or I could tell a story. Why don't I tell a story? Because it's it's going to stick in their mind. They're going to picture some things in their mind. Everybody remembers hearing President Monson tell the story of of almost burning down Provo Canyon. Right, right. Everybody remembers that story because you're imagining it in your mind. You're you're seeing him out there, you know, saying, "Well, we'll just light this little piece on fire, uh, and then none of this other stuff will burn." And then. Whoosh, right, the whole thing's going up in flames. Uh, and then if that story is replaying in my mind over and over and over again, all of a sudden, you know, uh, I think I was out mowing the lawn or something, thinking about President Monson's story. And I thought, he did that on purpose. He was trying to tell us about, you know, consequences. And uh, and there was other things involved there where his, you know, his parents were – Tommy, right? Like, <laughs> don't, don't do that again. Uh, he's teaching us about parenting. He was, he was teaching us all sorts of, of principles by just telling us a story and, and leaving it at that. So it, it can then, it can come back over and over and over again, instead of a, instead of a lecture, which I'm not against, you know, teaching doctrine, lecturing. Um, I do that quite a bit in my class, but what if we just were to to come into Sunday school or come into young men's, young women's, tell a story um, and then back off a little bit. And then maybe the next week say, Hey, did you, did you think about that? What, what, what lessons could we learn from, from this little story? Right. And see if it didn't, I don't know, marinate for a little while, yeah. see if it didn't sit with them for a little while. And they said, well, I was thinking about that. And I told my parents that story and they said this, and they said that. And, and, and maybe leaving that power there. The other good thing about stories is if someone experiences that same thing somewhere else sometime, that will come back to their mind, right? When I, when I, when I, I was riding my bike this week and I, and I went out, uh, I was on the other side of Utah Lake and there's all this corn growing, all this corn. And what did my mind go to? It went to the savior talking about seeds and growing you know, the parable of the seed growing secretly, which is the only parable in Mark um, that's unique to Mark, I should say. Uh, and I, and I, it brought back it, it brought back those same principles to my mind. I'm going, oh, he's, he's sneaky, uh, right? Because here I am riding my bike thinking about gospel principles because it's such a common item. Mm -hmm. uh, you have this wonderful way of kind of bringing things down to earth too, Um like you have an Instagram feed where you post things from time to time. I do, yeah. <laughs> and uh, some of the stuff you say has been really resonant to me. Like this one time, it was a fast Sunday, and you wrote something, correct me if I'm wrong, that said, hey, if you eat a cookie and forget that you're fasting, it's okay. The Lord isn't Dolores Umbridge. <laughs> the Lord isn't Dolores Umbridge. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a, a reference to Harry Potter. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about your thought process of coming up with those, what Elder Maxwell would call bite-sized bits of wisdom yeah. uh, that you're so good at. The sermons in a sentence. Oh, yeah. you're so kind to say that I'm good at it. I, I, you know, you never know if, if, if something's going to hit on social media, which is kind of a fun little game, you know, is, is anybody going to like this? Is anybody going to think this was a good insight or is that just going to, you know, is that just going to kind of fall flat, which is, it's pretty fun. Um, you know, what's interesting about social media, uh, Elder Bednar came to BYU I, I, it must be 10 years ago now uh, for Education Week. And he talked about social media and he said, you know, every one of us should have an account in which we're willing to, to share the gospel. 
beginning at this place on this day, I exhort you to sweep the earth with messages filled with righteousness and truth, messages that are authentic, edifying, and praiseworthy, and literally to sweep the earth as with a flood. And I, and I thought, well, okay. And so I started a little Instagram account and it just keeps growing. It just keeps growing. I think people like truth. I think they, it <laughs> tastes good, right? Uh, so here we are. I'm, I'm, I, I'm looking at 120,000 people now going, wow, there's a little more pressure here than there was when there was 50 of us. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I try not to try not to think of it that way. Um, and social media kind of forces us to condense our thoughts, right? Uh, especially Twitter. Twitter forces us to condense um, our, our teachings. For uh, good or evil. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. I can't, I only have 180 characters in which to say this, so I better be, uh, I better be succinct. And some people don't like it. Well, you should have mentioned this. You should have mentioned this. I'm saying, I know, I, <laughs> but I, all I had was four sentences. So uh, I had to give it that. Um, I, you can probably tell if you follow me on social media, which if you do, thank you so much. Um, you can probably tell the conversation I had that day mm -hmm. uh, because it, if I have a conversation with someone, um, I probably could have had that same conversation with a couple hundred people who are going through something similar. And so if you can tell that if I had a long conversation about mental illness, I will be doing some mental illness. Um, I'll be talking about it and the things that we talked about um, – trying to relate it to, you know, grab a scripture, grab, grab a parable or something like that and say, okay, how are we going to, how are we going to make this application, um, and make it succinct, uh, make it in a way that will help people because people are so busy, uh, and our lives are, um, there's so many voices, right? There's so many voices out there that, uh, the one thing I do in my thought process when it comes to social media is, um, I'm not writing a book here. I'm writing four sentences. And so, um, how can I do it in a way that will someone will see it, give it 10 seconds of their time and say, hey, that helped me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's been really fun, actually, to I call it just kind of expanding the classroom. Mm -hmm. Right. If if someone comes, if someone um, has this specific problem in their life, I'm betting a lot of people have that problem. Right. That which is one of my favorite quotes is that which is most personal is most universal. Mm -hmm. uh, the things, the very personal things we go to go through, a lot of people go through those things. Uh, we just don't talk about them very much sometimes, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Um, so that's my hope with with uh, social media is to say, okay, this is a very personal thing, um, but it's universal to almost everybody. So how can we how can we help? How What's a way that we can give someone a little boost, a little shot in the arm and make them go, you know, it's going to be okay. If you're interested in Professor Smith's excellent publication, Living the Parables, we've included a link to it at whyreligion.byu.edu. And remember that if you want to connect with us at Why Religion, comment and give insights on episodes you've listened to, see some behind-the-scenes photos and get bonus material, give us a follow on Instagram at Why Religion Podcast. Okay, we've arrived at the final segment of this episode of Why Religion, part three, where we like to talk with the professor about why the professor chose to be a religious educator, what led them to BYU, and why they choose faith. So we wrap up this episode with Hank Smith giving us some closing thoughts to those questions. Well, well, Hank, thank you so much. Um, and to, to end, we want to just give you an opportunity to share your testimony, which is so natural for you. Mm -hmm. You've done it um, a, a lot here today. But tell us kind of how you reconcile this, this intellectual part of your life and the spiritual part of your life and how you see those two things as uh, connective and mutually supportive of oh, each other. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, this is That's an incredible question, opportunity. Um, you know, I think of my knowledge of the gospel as, as if, if, if someone was here with me, I'd, I'd draw a circle for them. And here's my knowledge of the gospel. And the rim, uh, the outside of that circle, represents the questions that I have. And it seems that every time, every day that I study and these, this circle grows, my questions expand. I get more questions as I learn instead of less. And that shouldn't be happening, right? It, with any other topic, I should be knowing more and my questions should be should be going away, right? Mm -hmm. I should be answering my questions. But it seems that the Savior has designed the gospel 
uh, in a way that it's just beautiful, that as our knowledge grows of it, our questions, we get more and more questions. And those questions aren't a bad thing. They're not anymore. a bad thing at all. I, I have so many questions um, that uh, I, I almost, you know, when my, my daughter said, Dad, do you, are you afraid of dying? And I said, well, yeah, I don't want to leave anyone, but wow, I have a lot of questions. So <laughs> if, 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 that, if that means I get to ask my questions and get them answered, there's nothing wrong with having unanswered questions. I don't know where we got this idea that um, if you, to have a testimony, you have to understand everything. Absolutely everything. Um, there is a, there's a wonderful story in the Gospels in John chapter nine, where the Savior heals a man who's been who was born blind, and this this man is being questioned about his experience by those who are enemies of the Savior, and um, they want him to deny that Jesus helped him. They said, just give the credit to God, and just leave it at that. And the man responds with something. Wonderful. The, the Pharisees say, we know that Jesus is a sinner. And he said, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I know not. I love that part because he's saying, he's being honest about things he doesn't know. Right? I, I don't know that. Mm-hmm. And, and I like that he's honest about that. I don't think Jesus is a sinner. I've never even met him or I've never even seen him. Last time I saw him, I was blind, right? And then uh, he was gone by the time I could see. Uh, so he said, whether he's a sinner or not, I know not. There are some things I don't know. And then he, I just picture him turning to the Pharisees and he says, one thing I know, I was blind, now I see. Mm-hmm. There are some things I know for sure. Uh, and I'm not backing down on those just because there's things I don't know. So for me, um, the questions are important, but also what I know, the center of the circle, is just as important. And I'm not going to back down from those things. I think everybody listening has had experiences with the divine. You've had experiences with the divine. You don't know everything about the church. You don't know everything about the gospel. You don't know everything about its history. It, and you're not expected to, but there are things you know for sure. So for me, if someone were to come to me and say, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, fill in the blank, right? Jesus even is a sinner. Um, I might turn and say, I don't know everything. I honestly don't know everything. I didn't live in 1838. Neither did you. Um, I don't know everything, but here's what I know. The Book of Mormon changed my life. Right? What are they going to say to this blind man? You were never blind? He's like, yeah, I was. I was there. I remember. Well, you can't see right now. Yeah, I can, <laughs> actually. When someone, when I say, you know, the Book of Mormon changed my life, I was there for the whole thing. And I saw it happen. I experienced it for myself. And I think then we end up in the same place like Joseph Smith. I knew it. I knew that God knew it. I could not deny it. We end up in the same place as Jacob. I had heard the voice of the Lord speak to me from time to time. I could not be shaken. Um, Notwithstanding, we still have questions. We still have questions. Um, And uh, to me, that's the beauty of it. I don't don't think, I, I don't look forward to any time in my life where the questions are all answered. I'm, I'm excited to take some with me into, into the next life. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hi, guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.